Welcome to the podcast dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, and we have with us today Kyle Pfaffenbach from Eastern Oregon University, also from the Brooks Beast. We're stoked to have you back, Kyle. It's yeah, fun. appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, happy to be here. This is cool. We also have our CEO, Nate Pearson. It's going to be good times. Nate, we're going to talk about carbs today. Yes. <laughs> I was hoping you would. <laughs> Nate wants to talk about cars. <laughs> that's right. Uh, before we do that, if you're listening to this now and you have not yet tried red light, green light, that's a new feature that we've released that athletes, uh, Nate, AI FTP detection was wildly popular because people didn't have to do painful FTP tests. I think the, like, you know, on the, like the like ratio on this one is even higher. Like people are, this is hugely popular. Yeah. And instead of like once a month using it, you can use it every day. So that's yes, the, like yeah. the benefit. Yeah. You can, you can mess yeah. up your training every single day and it can tell you <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so many <exactly>. opportunities. <laughs> yeah. You can, this allows you to be able to do those group rides or do the other things that you want and say yes to them, but still keep your training on track. It's amazing. Go check it out. Uh, if you don't like it, you can <laughs> yeah, you get the emoji, th- emoji <laughs> thumbs up. Yeah. Thank you, Apple, for turning that on. They yeah, YouTube exactly. us by yeah. they YouTube us by putting YouTube on all of our phones, and now they turned on this emoji thing so that we get emojis on all of our videos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. so, um, but if you haven't yet tried it out, go check it out, trainerroad.com. Uh, and look back at your training history. It's really cool because you can see like, yes, that's accurate. That's accurate. And then that'll give you confidence to the future. And if you don't like it, we'll give you your money back. We're pretty confident you'll like it. So go try it. Uh, okay. But now let's get into Laura's question. She submitted this at trainerroad.com slash podcast. You can do that there, or you can do it through Spotify as well. And if you're listening on any platform, YouTube, whatever it might be, give this a like, thumbs up, share, all that great stuff. Laura says, do you know of studies that show how long it takes to adapt to high carb intake rates on the bike? Uh, thanks to the podcast, I upped my carb intake from, well, basically nothing up to 80 grams per hour. And like you said, it felt like I was cheating. I had the best year of training I've ever had, which is saying something as a 41-year-old woman who has been cycling since my mid-20s. Fast forward to today with my, with my, uh, starting my base training, having not eaten a gel since October, and I'm having a really hard time taking in even 40 grams per hour. It has me freaked out thinking I've lost the ability to take in carbs, but I know you've mentioned it does take time, but impatient me wants to know how long and why. <laughs> Thanks for your help. This is a really good, this one's huge because, yeah. uh, I think finally we talked about this I've, maybe last time. It seems like the world is starting to become more aware that like endurance athletes take in a lot of carbs and endurance athletes themselves, even the best ones in the world are actually starting to do it. So there is suddenly like this dragging up of everybody thinking like, Oh, I do need to take in more. So this is probably super relevant for a lot of people. Uh, Kyle, have you observed this and like, we can get into like the mechanisms in terms of what's going on, but, and I don't know if you know of any research that's actually like established on this, that it takes this long to adapt to this. I'm sure it's yeah. individual. Uh, so that, that was going to be my main point. The one that you just made. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff that we can talk about around this, but at the end of it, like it's just going to be different for everybody. And the top end of what people can achieve and be comfortable with in terms of the massive amounts that they can get in is also going to be variable. And it just sort of depends. It depends on how sensitive your gut is. It depends on how healthy your gut is. It depends on just probably a bunch of genetic factors that we haven't like even established yet. There's uh, I'm sure I'm leaving some things on the table, uh, in just in terms of like my knowledge and gaps in it. But I think the key is, I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff to talk about around this, but if I only had like three seconds to answer Laura's question, it would be, uh, just give it time and keep trying and go slower than, than faster. Like, don't say, Oh, I was here at the end of last year. I should maintain those. If you don't, you don't maintain stimulating a system, we typically lose the ability of that system or we revert back down to like what our genetic baseline is. And so if she took a really, um, and, and there's a little bit of one of the things that I've seen before, and this is purely anecdotal. Uh, one of the things that I've seen before is there's sort of a, um, a compressed timeline around the, uh, length of time it took to have an adaptation once you've experienced and enjoyed that adaptation for some point in time. So the, the thing with Laura is like, 
she had never experienced higher carbohydrates and she probably took like a very conservative approach, whether she knew like either she was still a little dubious of it, or I've been cycling since I was 20. What are these guys talking about? And then you finally like, there's probably some experimentation that she's not counting or not remembering. I'm not putting Laura, you may have the most amazing memory of anybody. I'm just generally saying, I don't, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not going after her uh, cerebral cortex. Uh, so <laughs> I'm just saying that, that, uh, a lot of times we think about we we it's sort of like a, a, a relationship that's in the rearview mirror. You remember the good times, uh, and so you you sort of have compressed that to a point where it probably took you quite a bit of time to get used to eighty grams of carbs, and you may not have even hit that until like a key race or something where you're like, I know this is going to help me. The the evidence is there. The it, I'm trending in the right direction. I'm just going to go for it. And then that, that happened. And then you think like, okay, well, and to be fair, Laura was talking about her base training. I, I'm pretty sure she submitted that question like December or January, but we're on a one, <laughs> we're on a one question <laughs> per podcast pace right now. Uh, and so, yeah, to be fair, I don't think she's just started her base training right now. And it'd be interesting to hear from her, quite frankly, and see if that adaptation did occur. But, but I do. I'd be really hesitant to give anyone a particular timeline. Um, what I would say, however, uh, I'm just trying to think of this. If I was like her nutrition consultant, for example, and I was thinking about this, I think if there was no progress or there was, um, issues so so she was having a lot of gi issues there were there were things that weren't just like oh i feel like i'm i'm sort of stressing the system a little bit and expanding my ability to do this if there were like clear things with gi distress and stuff like that at that point i wouldn't just say oh just give it time like we, we'd have to figure out what was going on at that point and there's a bunch of cool things that can affect uh carbohydrate uh, absorption and yeah, we could talk about those, but I'd say generally, yeah, you just have to give it time and you have to kind of up it. And then you also have to, it's, it's sort of like hydration in the sense that it's not the same under all conditions. And so it's going to be easier for you to train your gut on easy recovery rides. But that's a lot of times when people, uh, aren't thinking about eating as many carbohydrates as they possibly can because they're easier like zone one or zone two rats. And so you do have to be sort of intentional about, okay, yes, I'm doing the zone one or zone two ride. Yes, I could use fat as a fuel and, and run a pretty low like RER on this and, and make it through and be fine. Uh, but I'm actually intentionally trying to train my gut and i want to do it under conditions where i'm not as stressed and so i'm gonna try and push it a little bit here almost like as a you can be intentional about it i don't know You're if that so makes sense in, kyle you would uh, I, I, i've said this <laughs> years ago and people got so mad at me for it yeah exactly <laughs> so <laughs> can you imagine though like in the 90s yeah. i guess 90s is a bad time because of all the yeah. doping but when there was <laughs> hopefully less doping but then you're the only one who actually had tons of carbs and everyone yeah. else didn't like the and everyone would think that you were doping yeah yeah yeah. yeah exactly that's what lance just exactly 160 an hour <laughs> that was it uh, uh, uh Kyle, what about he, he, uh she talks about gels personally uh, i you know i can get to like 140 on liquid gels destroy me how does that impact people or should what things should people try? I think it's like, it's honestly personal preference. Like it's, um, and it, the, it culturally it's different between sports that I found. So like, for example, runners just think like, uh, like elite runners, <laughs> usually when I initially talked to them and again, I'm, I'm painting with broad brush strokes here. But they're just like, oh, those are for, gels are for like old people that are trying to like break four hours in the marathon. Like that's who eats gels, right? <laughs> or, or like, you know, obviously there's been a revolution in elite marathoners. Like, uh, there, but th those studies go way back. They go back into the late eighties, early nineties, where people were demonstrating that 
if you can get this fuel source in that has a limited capacity, that we have a limited capacity to store in the form of glycogen, if you can get that in at proper rates, you can sustain higher outputs for longer. I mean, this is like, this isn't new, even though the application of it does feel kind of new. Um, or, or it's like feels reborn in some ways. So, um, in terms of runners, for example, they have a hard time dealing with liquid because it's just, it, it's heavy, it's sloshing, it's cumbersome to carry, not ultra runners. I'm talking about people though that are doing like, I want these track and field athletes that are doing 12 to 15 miles at 530 pace on Sunday to like fuel and they just aren't. And so there we've just come up with things where like, it's like, uh, I'll, and we negotiate like, uh, you can have this much gel. You can, okay, I'll carry three, but I'm not carrying five. It's like this type of stuff, right? Or I have this much capacity. So, so that's part of it, just the logistics of it. Like, so even if they don't like gel, we have to find a gel that works for them because they're not going to run with water, for example. Uh, cyclists are a little bit different. Like there's just, you have to experiment in your own. And you, in, and when I say experiment, I don't mean to be, I, I don't mean to be like you have to hold on so tight that you have to lay out everything that you're going to do before every ride and go from there. What I'm saying with, um, experiment is that when you try something new or when you try something convenient or when you find a product that you, you seem to like the taste of or you can stand the taste of, you need to have awareness around that. So. It's just, I like that under these circumstances. When it's hot, I found this one easier to take on. When it was, when it's really hard ride, when, when I'm doing a six hour ride, I find that this flavor starts to like really seem too sweet and nasty. And I need something with a little less flavor or a little less sweetness. So again, these are so like broad. These are such broad answers, but there's no one sort of just right thing to say oh yeah you're a gel this is why oh you prefer liquid this is why um it's it's that was a really long non-answer oh i was also going to throw in there that soccer players are the worst they're they're basically doing high intensity intermittent aerobic and anaerobic exercise for 90 minutes and they only maybe take a couple squirts of water during an entire game and they barely eat um, and every soccer player that I've ever talked to, when I'm like, Hey, you should put some gels under your compression shorts. And when there's like a stoppage of play or plays on the other side of the field, you should eat them. And they're just like, it, it's just like so anathema to that culture. And, uh, but, but I think it would be like a huge competitive advantage for people, especially later in games. And there's, uh, there's actual studies demonstrate anyways, we, we don't want to do yeah. that. I think a soccer, sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to entertain your tangent for a bit because I love soccer, yeah. but I think it's like seven, roughly seven miles that the average player runs during a match and yeah, between over 90 10, minutes, 10 and, and 12 K. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's, and that's effectively like sprinting. Uh, so bursts yes. of sprinting, it's like just yeah. sugar burning. Like that's like what they're doing. 100%. <laughs> it's, it's, and like the thing is, is that like, we see such a drop off in, um, when you, when you look at the GPS data, uh, you start to see that like, uh, people, people use really interesting pacing strategies because they know they only have so much glycogen and they're not replacing it. So they can't just go all out all the time. The other thing that they, that happens is that, um, they are, uh, that they, they sort of pick their spots more selectively as the game goes on and their sprints are slightly slower and much shorter in length. So like if there's a situation that they could attend to somewhere, but it's too far away, it wouldn't have been too far away when they were full of glycogen. And there's, there's central nervous implication. Like there's a bunch of cool, there's central fatigue, cool. like implications and stuff like that. But so culturally it's, it's like, it really matters. Cyclists, I think are the best, like cyclists and, and triathletes Probably. are pretty good yeah. too. Yeah. And they, they like embrace it. They know it. But these are also people that have a lot of access uh, to their to like very clear performance numbers. They can see what it does. They're also the volume is really high. I think the worst, the the hardest sport to like feed somebody on is swimming because like it's not easy to eat. But the volume 
the nature of the sport requires massive training volumes. And, and so th- that's some unique challenges. So like, yeah, I mean, if I was talking to you, Nate, and you were like, I don't really like gels. I like drinking fluid. I'd just say then drink fluid, especially if you can just, if, if you can get it in. Um, and there'd probably be some times where like, if you were so sick of it, we would, um, mix in like some solid foods and there's some pretty good bars out there now that are, you know, low in fiber and, and don't have a lot of fat and stuff like that. And it would, it would just depend on the situation. Hmm. I, I have was like thinking that if you got, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. Sorry, Nate, go ahead. I was just thinking if you got stuck on one gel at a certain, like at 40, maybe then try to do gel and drink or just drink and mix it up. If you get stuck, even if you love the gel, this is the best tasting gel I've ever mm-hmm. had. hundred uh, percent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I don't know. So like I said, the runners go with just the gels, the, the cyclists, we almost always try and run a combination and it's, it's very tailored to what they kind of just their personal need, right? They have different tolerances to sweetness. They have different tolerances to just the texture and they have different tolerances to, um, the, the, there's literally like the enjoyment factor, I think is pretty important when you're spending so much time and you're just eating. There's also a cost at a certain extent. Like a lot of the people I work with have sponsorships, right? And so that's fine. But if you're like trying to buy, um, whatever, if you, if you're going through like three or four never second gels an hour and you're riding 20 hours a week, that's like a lot of money to, yeah. just spend in you can figure out how to make your own kind of gels and drinks and those types of things there's also um you know it's interesting with the gravel folks there's a big gas station culture now in terms of just like <laughs> it's all about calories and just what can we grab and there's real conversations that happen with the gravel riders around like there there's some no no there's some things that probably aren't going to help your performance if you choose foods with those ingredients, even if those foods seem to be high in calories and they're enjoyable. Um, Other times you say, yeah, okay, well then let's just get those things and make an exception because you're on an eight hour ride and, and you have to have some sanity. So, I mean, there's, uh, it's just hard to give like a single sort of thing. What I will say in regards to this, Nate, is that, the the hotter it is, the harder it is to take on solids or gels. And the harder you're exercising, the harder it is to take on solids and gels. So there's an inverse relationship between like heat stress and intensity stress and the complexity of the carbohydrate that you're the for, the complexity of the form of the carbohydrate you're trying to take on. What about um I've seen the drinks talk about osmolarity. And can Mm -hmm. you explain what that is and like why we care about it? And it always seems silly because you're eating food, but then also drinking this perfect osmolarity drink. And I'm like, but I'm having gel at the same time. Does that mess it up? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. So this, so shout out to uh, this guy named Oscar Yukindru. He's like a legend. You guys may have heard of him or or come across his papers or that sort of thing. So so he's really like his academic route. He, he was an academic based over in, um, England, I think is where his big, and now, now he kind of does stuff for different companies and different world tour teams and things like that. But, um, he, he really has some really important papers going back into the nineties and early two thousands regarding this idea that it's, the way the gut functions and the way the gut works, it's more than just putting the nutrient into the gut. It, like that isn't the only thing that's happening there. And there's a balance between the salt, the water and the carbohydrate and there's co-transporters that matter. And so the other thing is, is that with, with the osmolality, um, you're, you're basically there talking about, um, kind of, uh, uh, can I say this? Uh, you're basically talking about different concentration gradients and how things can move across those with selective barriers or selective, uh, receptors and things like that. They're involved. So the, the basic way that I explain this is I just say that like 
diff- there's different receptors doing different things in your gut that are facilitating the uptake of different types of sugars and different types of um, uh, fluids and different types of nutrients into the systemic system. And so if you really back up and think about this, like our digestive tract is literally this tube that is through the middle of our body that is goes from the opening on the top and in the front to the opening at the bottom and in the back. And that that tube is kind of separate from the rest of our body, what we call the systemic circulation or the systemic system. And the idea is that we we don't we we don't process the ability to make everything that we need to function as a human life form. We have to consume things. And so when we consume things, <laughs> your, your timing was impeccable there. <laughs> when we when we consume things. Uh, it goes down this tube system. Because I'm obviously like simplifying this, but it goes down the tube system. And then we, we reserve the ability to extract the things that are going to help the system and, and leave the things that aren't going to help the system or, or help the system in, in a way that, that helps the gut itself function. And so, for example, uh, this is the actual definition of an endotoxin. You know, how people say like, "Oh, drink lots of water, it'll flush the toxins." And I'm like, "Could you define that, please? Could you like <laughs> tell me how it's measured? Could you uh, uh, give me like like There's another thing that Nate pointed out on the podcast years ago? By the way, <laughs> I've been catching some <laughs> Nate, Nate. <laughs> yeah. a lot of flack. For Do you just bring me on? Like, like yeah. people are going to start to think we like pre. We pre-pod and, and I'm just, yeah, and no, you're no, like, no. listen, you got to say that. I've been hanging on to this for three years. You got to. I'm just a fan of science, Kyle. And so to have a, a scientist on that can explain all this stuff uh, is validating. <laughs> oh, yeah. But People the argue with me, though, so bad. Like the talking thing. <laughs> Yeah. The scientist like, describes it. <laughs> I just described the digestive system as a tube. It's a whole yeah. up and hold the bottom. Yeah, very scientific. <laughs> yeah, it's so scientific. Uh, very elo- <laughs> eloquent. Uh, yeah. So, so, anyways, the the idea here is that, uh, so so we don't want endotoxins, for example. And when endotoxins do find their way into the system, we typically have a bad reaction to that. So this is what like stomach flus and stomach bugs and things like that are. And you uh, try and eject everything that's in the tube um, as efficiently as possible. And you, you know, run up a fever to try and kill the bacteria that's made its way into the system. But we're eating bacteria all the time. We're eating stuff that we don't want into the system all the time. But the integrity of the gut is maintaining the the sort of, it's selecting and taking out what's so the idea of osmolality is the relationship between particulates in a certain amount of fluid. And the balance between particulates and fluid across membranes can influence the way things move across those membranes. That's the most simple way to put it. And so what we know is that uh, different variations in osmolality influence the way things move across that membrane and the efficiency with which they do so. There's also some like transporters that work with uh multiple components not just like so there isn't just like a hole for example that oh, kind of uh <laughs> uh so so so, the, so transportation of molecules across membranes can be more complex than just a pore that lets that's in the shape of the thing that it's letting across and so for example there there are kind of transporters that that bind uh uh, sodium along with glucose and transport those across the membrane with water, for example. So like, for example, uh, from an electrolyte standpoint, it, Gatorade always talks about, I'm just using them because everybody knows who they are. Um, and there's actually a lot of really interesting R&D that has been done. Gatorade has a GSSI. They have a Gatorade Sports Science Institute. Before they were bought by Pepsi, it was a very interesting kind of, there's a lot of cool stuff going on there. And um, so so with that in mind, Gatorade sort of puts salt in their solution. And they talk about replacing electrolytes with sweat and stuff like that. But the amount, if you look closely, the amount of electrolytes that are in Gatorade are way below what 
are recommended or what are found in other more electrolyte specific drinks, especially for people that are salty sweaters, which is a different topic. And the, um, the, but what they found was that they could increase the ability to get, uh, sugar into the gut if they put it with a certain amount of liquid and a certain amount of salt. And that's kind of, um, my understanding is that's the idea behind that. And so you have these co-transporters, you have these different ways of getting different things across the barrier. There also is uh, some evidence, and you guys are also aware of this because you know there's a lot of attention on the like mixtures and and the sort of ratios of fructose and glucose and how much this and that. And and one of the things that's kind of interesting is that uh, you know glucose and fructose are handled differently by the liver as well, so that's kind of interesting. But they're also like. There seems to be a multiple ways to get things across the, the gut. Well, well, there are multiple ways to get things across the gut barrier into the systemic circulation. And if you have only one kind of molecule, it seems to slow that down. Mm-hmm. And so you put a mixture of molecules into there and, and I could be like, I don't spend a ton of time researching this because it's uh, in like really boring down into every paper. So I'm sure we can find someone that could like speak more eloquently than this on it. But from a practicality standpoint, you want a mixture of sugars. You don't want high fructose corn syrup. You don't want too much fructose. You want a mixture of a variety of chains of chain lengths of glucose seem to help. So you can have some amylopectin, for example, some longer chains, you can have some simple glucose, you have a little bit of fructose, and like all of that with uh, some salt and water in not too concentrated of a form seems to play really nice with the stomach. Yeah, this is, and and that's why I feel like athletes probably don't have to worry about maintaining this perfect osmolarity of their gut right to be able to say that like yes everything uh, you know because i took in that gel and i didn't take in a certain amount of water or or vice versa i've thrown it all off and i'm not going to be able to digest rather that actually a certain like a, a a diverse profile within our gut within certain constraints does seem like it's 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 that's the main thing that you want to have yeah that's so i think you bring up a really good point but uh, there's a couple, so, so the gut is sort of like the kidneys where they're like exact, but they sort of do their own thing. Like you just give it what they need and they'll make the adjustments. It'll make the adjustments that it needs to the degree that it's able to make that adjustment. So when we have conversations about hydration, for example, it's a, it's in the same vein where it's like, it's exactly inexact. I don't know if I'm describing this like properly or right or, but the point is, is that like, you can get the right mixture of things generally. And as long as you're pretty close, these things will take care of themselves. But there are going to be little pieces of individuality within there. So you may know I get a really sensitive gut when it's hot out, or I get a really sensitive gut when I do threshold workouts. And so I need to find something that doesn't um, like that, that works where I can absorb nutrients that plays nice with my stomach but doesn't, but there isn't just like one formula. That's where that idea of awareness comes from, where like you're like, okay, I'm gonna offer variability. I'm gonna understand these things about my gut under these different conditions. I take care of my gut with, with other things that make it receptive to taking these things on. And then I'm gonna, um, uh, figure out like what it is that works under different circumstances. And to be honest with you, like having a good gut that can take just a lot of sugar in and and actually absorb it without a lot of GI distress and having a high tolerance for sweetness is like a talent for an endurance athlete. It's 100% a talent. <laughs> Kyle, when I was in college, I wanted to run a marathon. This is when I first was reading about um, carb intake and calories and stuff like that. And my training, I was like, okay, I want to be able to eat a lot and be able to still work out. So I would eat a full dinner in college as much as I can. And I would sprint this like three mile track as fast as I could with a completely (laughs) full stomach. And I thought I'm going to train myself to be able to handle a bunch of food in my stomach and running. And I mean, that was 20 years ago. I think it paid off. 
Like, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it worked. I can even like, hunt when now, people but... when people have iron guts, it's like now not everybody would have been able to adapt to that. So that's like a genetic gift. They didn't try hard. The, enough, huh? the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> just yeah. Keep trying, just keep. <laughs> What's the definition of insanity? Uh, yeah, exactly. So so uh, yeah. So I think though that <laughs> this is awesome. We're just re, we were just rehashing the in like uh, ten years. Someone's going to be like, "What you need to do is do sprints <laughs> yeah, exactly. when you have the full <laughs> stomach, and they show that that your body adapts and with the yeah. amount of food and your stomach changes. Cause it's like an inexact, exact science." So I, I mean, when we go, <laughs> when we if if we like, <laughs> it's awesome. When we bring it back to to Laura's question, <laughs> like, uh, and what I would say to her is like, one, um, if if you have a record of an actual objective record, not recollection record of, of what the process was like the last time she got carb adapted and got up to 80 grams of carbs per hour, um, to kind of look at that timeline and maybe recreate it possibly slightly more aggressively Two, uh, did she switch the products that she was using when she was at the 80 grams and that she's trying now, maybe she, heard something from somebody or she's going to try this new thing or she's making her own or those types of things. So assess what it is that you're doing. Three, look at like, are there particular intensities and are there particular environmental conditions that are causing it? Because if she's saying like, oh, I have these big workouts and eating so many carbs was so good for me, I'm only going to do it during the hard workouts. Well, then you're going to have a harder time training the gut up to be able to, to have the capacity to do that. And then four, like, you you really have to um, make sure you're well hydrated, and then there's a bunch of other considerations that that she can look at. Like, has she been on antibiotics in the last six months? If she was, did she take uh, probiotics to kind of reseed her gut bacteria and things like that? Is there are there changes in stress level? Are there changes in? There's just a whole bunch of different things that go into like making sure you have like the base kind of like sort of healthy gut and they were ready to roll. And then you introduce these things in a controlled environment and you can sort of like do some problem solving and figure out what works for you. Yeah. I I have a question on this, Kyle. I, I don't know mm. if is what's mechanically changing in our gut. I don't know if we know this because the gut yeah, itself, yeah. it seems like is uh it will be a, a perpetual mystery in terms of us like figuring yeah. out exactly how it works, but yeah, what's actually changing when I take in 60 grams an hour and my gut is upset Yeah, yeah. to after I'm adapted and I'm taking in 120 grams an hour and my gut isn't upset. Is there anything yeah. that's actually that we know is changing in the gut? So, so there's a couple things. One is that th there's a couple things that are, I think just if we start at the bottom and think about it, there's a couple really basic things about the gut that are really important. One is that it's one of the most rapidly turning over tissues in our body. It basically, the entire gut, the epithelial layer of the gut, basically, I don't know, someone's going to probably like get me on this, but it basically turns over like daily. So um, it's like not a small, it would shock you if you heard how much of your protein you just get from sloughed gut cells. Like the recycling slough gut cells, for example. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's so, crazy. <laughs> so, so our, 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 the, the inside of the gut is constantly like dying and turning over and replenishing itself. Um, so it'd be short sighted to think that it's just this like static thing, even though I described it earlier as just this tube through your body. It's still like a really dynamic, living, physiologic, complex physiologic system. So, uh, and it's rapidly turning over, which means that it can be, uh, it's, it's adaptable. It, it can take on new characteristics. It can be trained, those sorts of things. So there's probably like, uh, from a mechanics there, there's, it's likely that there is increased receptor expression, but, but those types of changes, just like training adaptations don't occur overnight. So it's not just like getting what's there used to being exposed to this new thing. They're actual, like you're stimulating the system with a stress and a signal and that signal, you, you have to have time to respond to that signal. And so there's, there's going to be increased expression of the receptors in terms of the types of sugars that you're seeing. It's one of the arguments for giving it a variety of sugars because 
you maybe will be stimulating a variety of responses in a way that makes you like on a greater scale, more uh, able to take up uh, sugars and things like that. And so there's those different types of things. The second thing is, is that the gut, so the gut's really interesting. It has a, and again, I'm not an expert in the gut. I just know what I know from, from looking this stuff up and working with athletes, but the, um, the gut is, is the inside wall of the gut. It looks just like this, <laughs> but, but the, <laughs> these two hands, uh, but the inside wall of the gut is actually a single layer of epithelial cells, uh, so it's a muscle basically lined with a single layer of cells. And those single layers of cells are held together by what are called gap junctions. And when there's compromise, when those gap junctions get compromised, you can get like endotox, actual definition of endotoxins that creep in into the systemic system or they get into niches that they're not supposed to be in because the integrity of that gut junction. And this is one of the things we know happens during uh, really hot, like high intense exercise during the heat. One of the reasons why it, it messes with the gut is because it starts to compromise those gap junctions. So that's another like mechanical thing that may be just sort of like you're stressing the system in these new ways. You may be trying to like introduce some, some intensity or length or your, your, you, you know, it's just, it's a very dynamic environment. So you have. It takes time to get the the sort of gene and protein expression changes that can occur in that require that are required to express the new proteins for adaptation. You have these mechanical or these you, you know different environmental and stress um, uh, stimulus that could be compromising the gap junction, and there's probably some adaptations in creating greater integrity for there. And then the last part of it that I think is really important. Um, is that it the whole thing is covered in this slime it's like this mucus layer that's really really important and the health of that mucus layer is uh critical to the integrity of the gap junction and the integrity and functionality of the gut in terms of absorbing nutrients and so that mucus layer is also compromised with hard exercise particularly the heat in the heat and so we, we put a lot of attention on taking care of the integrity of the gut, taking care of the integrity of the mucus layer, making sure that mucus layer is happy and interacting with gut bacteria and those types of things in, in a healthy way. And then, um, we try and think about the different types of conditions, intensities, or products that cause GI distress. And we can't exactly identify and say, oh, that one's messing up your gap junctions or that one's messing up. But we have to experiment at that point and try and figure out, okay, what's happening under these conditions and what can we do to, to still maintain getting nutrients into the system, but like reduce the stress that's on your gut. Okay. I have three questions kind of related to that. I have like, First one's I have not like related. 17. Uh, <laughs> Kyle, are you wearing two watches? First question. Yeah. So they do different things. It's a carryover. I was on vacation uh, to, at my mom's house in Georgia and the, the, the new Apple watch for all that it like does, it, it has really bad tide functionality. And this one that has really good tide functionality. And so we were like surfing and doing things. So anyways, the stopwatch no. is easier on this one. No. There, there's real reasons for it, but you yeah, see, I'm wearing two watches. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with DC Rainmaker, but he'll have like four watches on all the time. I'm going to go look him up right now. No. <laughs> okay. So the next question, uh, putting these together, could you, we talk about training the gut during exercise. What about if she ate more carbs while not exercising, just daily diet more carbs? And inside of that, also eating more fruits and vegetables, things that are known to improve the gut bacteria in your yeah. stomach at the same time. Could those two things in combination then make it so that she can absorb more while she's training? The, the first one, I'm more dubious of for a variety of reasons. And, and I don't know this for a fact, but this is what my gut says, is that no pun intended. Uh, That's good. That's good. It wasn't good. It was so bad. And it just came out, too. That was not planned, I promise you. That was so bad. Uh, but I, but I just, and, and I give all these caveats because I just, I don't want to be that guy. Look, 
this is like uh uh you guys have a big platform and it's <laughs> it's out of my yeah. I just I don't want to be the give the impression that I just like always know what's right under all Let's these speculate. circumstances for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So so if if I'm just giving you what I know at this moment sitting in this chat, because this is a really interesting question, I would say probably not because of the nature of specificity to stimulus adaptation. So if I think of it at just that basic level, it's mm -hmm. like you <laughs> you don't get fitter by not exercising, for example. So it really is that unique milieu of the exercise plus the nutrient consumption like coming under in. Load. Exactly. And, and yeah. the thing is, is like, you know, there's a bunch of really interesting rabbit holes we could delve into about the nature of sustained high intensity exercise. Like what, what the evidence would suggest. And if you go look at like really interesting people like Daniel Lieberman, who's a anthropological, uh, like basically performance physiologist at Harvard, which is a really cool job. He like studies performance physiology through the lens of the fossil record, essentially. And so he's the reason why people started running barefoot <laughs> a couple of years ago. Anyways, because of the, we, we, we do seem to have no, no species on earth can do slow endurance activity better than humans. But slow endurance activity, you can get away with using fat. When we're getting into these things, like what we're talking about, where we want to be at high intensity, we're basically extending this skill that was sort of meant to close the deal on a hunt or evade uh it, it wasn't necessarily meant to be like going up out to uh, at as yeah. okay. hard as we can. Does that make sense? It, like you that, can argue, you can race. make, yeah. yeah, you can make that argument. So the idea that we could just eat carbs and then our gut starts to like carbs under any conditions is probably, but we are super adaptable. Like humans are adaptable. It's our number one quality. We're like, we're like way more adaptable than cockroaches. Like I, I'm not afraid of us what's going to happen to us as a species because of our diversity and because of our adaptability. And so because of that, I think you have to create, you, you have to recreate the specific circumstances if you want that stimulus. It's sort of like saying, well, I want to be a, uh, I want to be a really fast sprinter, but I'm just going to run like long, slow. Yeah. And I'm going to hike the Appalachian trail. You're not going to become a sprinter by hiking the Appalachian trail. So what about the fruit and vegetables, maybe eating yeah. lots of that to improve your gut health. Yeah. So the vegetable part of it is, I think, more important than the fruit part of it. And this is probably going to, you know, incite a lot of, I think like fruits have a place. My sort of opinion in regards to fruits is to make sure that you're consuming fruits with a complex meal because fruits are high in sugar. And depending on how your gut bacteria, how a person's gut bacteria is and and how they respond to particular types of food there there is evidence that like certain fruits that are absolutely healthy for you from uh they have lots of vitamins and micronutrients and some you know five different types of fiber and things like that but like a banana has a ton of sugar in it and it depending on how you absorb that it can really cause a big insulin spike and I think it's pertinent for most people living in modern society to try and manage the number of times that they get big insulin spikes per day. And so you're looking at, you know, three meals a day and maybe a post post exercise recovery drink. Um, and, you know, a lot of times with carb modulation and stuff like that, you're actually looking more like three times a day. So three to four times a day, you're, so if you do up your fruit intake, like, I don't recommend that as like, you know, a lot of people say, oh, grab an apple. You'll hear dietitians and different people say this, grab an apple as a snack. It's like, uh, I'd rather eat like beef jerky, to be honest with you, if you're hungry, because protein's more satiating. There's no insulin. There's no carbohydrates in it. Um, if you're going to eat your apple, eat it, but eat it with your breakfast that also has protein and other complex and you get it all on a Captain crunch. crunch. <laughs> uh, okay with crunch berries i guess so <laughs> so tell tell me about the uh adaptation to that specific food to the roof of your mouth 
Yeah, and I was just the, gonna say, uh, coming out for Nate's mouth. Poor, yeah, poor yeah. yeah, yeah, He's pretty strong. The, uh, okay, <laughs> it's just, I'm just joking. He had the orthodox goddess who put an iron plate like yeah, in the top. Yeah. Of, like, <laughs> I can't do a Captain Crouch, so I'm gonna install an iron plate in the roof of my mouth. But uh, in terms of like eating, maybe on the vegetable side of things, it's like things that are rich in fiber and that sort of thing. That, that yeah, seems so like green a, leafy a, vegetables are amazing for uh, amazing fiber source, and fiber is yeah. super important. This is. This is a really interesting like topic because there there are times when you want things with fiber and there's times when you want things with less fiber because we don't have the enzymes to break the glucose linkages that make up fiber. So they're beta you it is glucose. Like lettuce is glucose, cell walls are glucose, right? Cellulose is glucose. They are polysaccharides, but we can't access the polysaccharides because of the way the glucoses are linked together. We don't have the enzyme that can link it, which is why we can't eat grass, but horses can or cows can. They get calories from grass because they have the enzyme that can break that linkage. So what is the role of fiber then? And the role of fiber, especially insoluble fiber, and what I say by insoluble fiber is like, if you take a bunch of grains that are high in soluble fiber and you say, oh, these are whole grains, there's lots of fiber in them. You put it in a bowl, you pour hot water on it, you come back a couple of minutes later, there's no more water and there's all these big swollen grains, right? That's soluble fiber. Part of that meal we can absorb and when I say absorb, I mean get it through the gut into our system. Um, and if we're thinking about it in terms of athletic performance, get it to the muscle so that it can be either stored as glycogen or used as glucose and glycolysis. And so if you uh, – fiber doesn't do that. So, so how does fiber get broken down? Well, fiber gets broken down by the bacteria that live in our colon and our large intestine. And it – serves other functions as well. It, it can add volume to stool. Uh, and particularly in the case of insoluble vitamin uh, or insoluble vitamins, insoluble fiber, which is your, your lettuce, your green leafy vegetables, things like that. You put those in a bowl, you pour hot water on it, you come back five minutes later, it's just a bowl of hot floating lettuce, right? It's not taking on that water. And so those insoluble fibers are really important for greasing the tracks, so to speak, on your colon, and then also um, in softening the stool. And so it's really important for like regular bowel movements, regularity, those types of things to get all that fiber. And as Nate alluded to, these types of fibers are also fed on by the bacteria in our gut. That's how they get broken down. And it's and it's critical to give them a variety of fibrous food sources, which is why a variety of um, why a variety of of raw vegetables is really important. And so the recommendation is even if you are like nailing your macros, and we talked a lot about macros in the last episode and calculating them and things like that. One of the caveats with that is you can nail your macros, but at every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you should be getting some sort of raw, uncooked vegetable. The reason why I say uncooked is because when you do cook it, uh, there is some changes to some of the vitamins and minerals and integrity and things like that. So having raw vegetables, uncooked vegetables is good uh, under like, and, and that's sort of a regular drip that you want coming into the system. Yeah, hmm. that is, uh, this is total anecdote, but I've noticed, you know, I'll hit all my macros, but at times in training, we'll I'll have like a bowl of spinach with, with salad with carrots and like some nuts and seeds and uh, bell peppers and uh, I don't know, some other vegetables that I would throw in there. And it wouldn't even be that much, but I do that every day. I would actually train, I, I'd feel so much better um, hmm. on the bike too. And I, I'm wondering if I was like you said, feeding your gut the back, the, the fiber that you need. Um, yeah. So this, also want, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Go. No, you go ahead. My other part is I do protein shakes and yeah. I, um, I'll put spinach in there and blend the spinach. And it's not enough. Like it still stays cold, but is yeah. that going to mess something up or is that going to be just fine? Because I would do, normally just chew it. Right. I would kind of be doing the same thing. Yeah. So the, t for your first question that, that is, I don't want to say like, yeah, that makes total sense. That makes now, you can't because there's okay. a bunch of there's a bunch of things that could be happening there. Like it, it can kind of make sense for a variety of reasons, but we'd have to look at the complete picture. For example, like yeah. if you're eating a bunch of spinach and now you're all of a sudden starting to feel better, I would wonder 
what your folate level was in your blood yeah, work before right. you yeah. started eating mm -hmm. the spinach. So, so iron's an interesting one because they do say spinach has a lot of iron, but that's for plants and it sucks compared to like Red meat. basically eating blood. Yeah. So, yeah. um, uh, and it's not, it's not in a very absorbable form. So anyways, you can't like combat anemia by just eating a lot of spinach. I wouldn't think, uh, I, I don't like to make definitive statements, but that, no, that scientist, is, you can't. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, it seems to so <laughs> it's it is possible. Uh, but if I said that, then would I be a chief scientist? If I stated no. that it was impossible? Exactly. No. So the thing with this is, is that anecdotally, I I do think it's really important to get raw vegetables at every meal, not every day at every meal. And I don't think this has to be super complicated. And so I work with a lot of like people that are just straight out of college. They've turned pro. They're starting to like on their journey and they're like, how am I going to do this? And I was like, well, you buy one of those plastic tubs of spinach. And every time you start making a meal or you go by the fridge, you reach in, grab a handful and eat it. And like, we've, we've had success doing things like that. Right. The other thing was I, I had one athlete one time that was, um, recovering from injury and, uh, it was just like, you know, he couldn't train and this is his full-time job. He couldn't train and, and training was being born. And we were just trying to talk about ways of like maximizing recover or trying to support maximization and recovery and things like that. And, and one of the issues we had had was that his raw vegetable intake was just very consistent. It was the same sort of bowl of spinach with a few carrots and, you know, that sort of, it became too consistent. And I was like, all right, well, let's, like as something to work on to give you something to do while you're recovering from this, a part of something to do while you're just cross training, doing rehab. Let's see how many different types of like cultivars of vegetables you can eat in a month. And I think he got 32 different raw vegetables in a month, right? It was just like every time he went to the store, he would buy like two things he'd never heard of. Uh, and, and then you just eat it raw and just eat it, you know, and like, well, I mean, it's, it it's like, I wouldn't say like eat potatoes raw or something like that, yeah. but the, um, but there's just different approaches like that to make sure that you're mixing and matching things. I've also gone all the way back to just like baby food packets for people that just can't get to eat raw vegetables, but there's no sugar added and there's no fruit in them. They're just the ones that are like, you know, peas and spinach and it's just blended up and put in a baby food packet and i can kind of get a certain type of person to eat that on a regular basis and even that seems to be important so the reason why the the thing it doesn't surprise me that you're feeling better but we can't say exactly why because the NO2, there's just right, also. so many good things yeah. in fetch but there's so many vitamins there's so many minerals there's so many micronutrients so many phytochemicals there's so many there's probably a bunch of things that this is one of the things that have you guys might remember this, but a couple of years ago, there was a study that came out that basically showed that organic vegetables are no different than, than regularly grown vegetables in their like nutrition content. And I thought it was a really short sighted study only in the sense that they, they were really, they were not, uh, very, uh, scientific, <laughs> let's say. In, in saying, I thought it was a really bold thing to just say there's no difference in the nutritional value between these things when we probably don't know all the nutritious things. We, we can't just assume that, you know, vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin C are the only things that matter when you're eating whole foods. And, and all the evidence would suggest that that isn't the case, that, that it's more than the sum of what we understand and know in terms of just strictly, because you can't, like you probably wouldn't have felt that good if you had just taken vitamins in the exact same amounts as what we know of, right? But there's all these complex things going on with the the micronutrients and phytochemicals and those types of things. The last part of it in regards to the gut bacteria is really interesting. There's lots of cool new studies coming out about the importance of gut bacteria in athletes and the and the importance of nurturing it and taking care of it and feeding it with the right and, um, you know, a lot of times I think like a lot of things in, in the wellness and, and fitness industry, the, the sort of 
the growing thread of common knowledge around gut bacteria is creating all these products that are like underpowered or they'll put a dash of something in that's a hundred times below the effective thing, but then they'll market it as that thing and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so you have to like, <laughs> uh, so, so you, you should be considering those types of things, but when you take care of your gut bacteria and when you feed it, the, these raw vegetables that are its preferred like food source there's a bunch of different like theories of why that could be beneficial there's there's uh impacts on the immune uh on on the immune systems uh teaser uh sort of for the was that Laura's second question or a different question? Oh, no. It's a different question. One. Totally different get to question. That's next month, Kyle. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <worry>. exactly. <laughs> uh, so, so the, 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 but there's also things like certain bacteria uh, actually feed on lactic acid or lactate. I shouldn't say lactic acid. They feed on lactate, right? So, and then exercise also impacts the, the gut microbiota and the gut milieu. And then, there's also, uh, you know, one of the well-known kind of byproducts of, of probiotic bacteria or probiotic uh, uh, metabolism is called uh, butyrate, which is short-chain fatty acid, which is really like anti-inflammatory and potentially immunomodulating and all these different things. And so the point is, is like, it doesn't surprise me that you feel better when you're eating lots of raw vegetables. And, but it could be for like so many different interesting reasons. I, I think the big point is everyone should just do it. The, the, the downside yeah. is it's even cheaper than like other food. You know what I mean? Like you go to the store, the you, vegetables are so cheap, uh, yeah. at least in the U.S. compared to like a package of Oreos or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Really, yeah. So, no so to. I was, I was actually just, I was having this discussion actually with a runner yesterday and. And we were talking to about like, if, if you have to make tough cuts from a financial standpoint, and it sucks that people have to do this around their health and food and things like that. It just, it just does. But like, there is an argument to be made to where like, if you're gonna spend a little bit more, or if you're going to partition a little bit more, uh, just this is my personal sort of thoughts on it are to do it with your meat sources and your animal sources because they're just harder to wash than, than vegetables and fruit. And there's, you know, ev everybody should go look at this thing. There's this list that comes out from one of like a world health organization or something like that every year called the dirty dozen, which are sort of the, it's the 12 fruits and vegetables that require the most sort of pesticides and, and things to maintain their growth. And they also are the most delicate in terms of scrubbing and washing and trying to get those things. So blueberries are always on it. Strawberries are on it sometimes. There's different things like that. Whereas things like avocados, which have like amazing um, mixture of a variety of different fats and they're high in vitamin E, um, they, they're, they have good antioxidant capacity. They're just like a very nutritious food. They have this super thick, tough shell on the outside of it that you don't eat. So maybe save some some money by by not having organic avocados for example so yeah. you can be thoughtful about those types of things it doesn't have to be just organic everything just because it's the most expensive thing and it's at whole foods the cool this is a side note but with you know ai is going to change the world and i've seen these guys seen these huge things they're almost like they look like combo side comp combine harvesters but they're big machines and they go over the plants and they use lasers to not kill to kill bugs but also the weeds around it yeah, and so they don't crazy. have to use pesticides that. and they just go blah, 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 and it's like so just interesting yeah it's like star wars just killing all the bugs and everything and then they don't have to and they, they also have ai to pick the fruit too so it's just at the right ripeness right without having to use um rely on humans on their decision. Our feeble, but, our feeble human brain. <laughs> but you can imagine though, how much the cost of organic food could go down if it was, you took out all the, the human labor power. And I know people are like, people are gonna lose their jobs. Compost harvester, like cotton gin, all, all of these things over time. We used to have people do a whole bunch of work uh, on in tobacco and cotton and stuff. And, you know, mm -hmm. people evolution changed uh, with 
inventions of science. And it is like, it's always a disruption, disruption to society. And uh, AI is going to be huge. Like maybe all of our jobs are going to be gone. Uh, yeah. But it, hopefully in the long run, it'll be better for humanity and what we will adapt as Kyle says too. Yeah, these things are super interesting. Um, wasn't there just a thing on the Daily Show about AI taking over? I think there was. There was just a I'm skit. Sure it seems was. to be like this conversation, the conversation you have seems to be in the zeitgeist at the moment. Like, and I think it's really interesting because sure. I do, um, you know, like uh, I've used AI, for example, just for like fast uh, to check recipes and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like, the, the amount of feedback you can get and the fact that you, that we could now think, for example, that like Google is a clunky way to find <laughs> information immediately, like that's mm -hmm. crazy to me. Uh, especially, I mean, like I'm aging, or, or I'm aging myself. Oh, is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, I was raised when there was no internet. So like I, I've, have this perspective of of like uh, i've laughed at myself that it's like oh it's way easier to look up the protein content of this meal under <laughs> using ai than it is using google which is no. ridiculous yeah i yeah. another side note but um john and i our kids go to the same school which is a monastery yeah. school and i love them so much except for the tech side and until recently to look something up they had to go to the library to look stuff up in a book and yeah, i was like that's not my exactly. daughter's now yeah. in seventh grade and now what they do is they're not allowed to use Google. They're supposed to go to only a few websites and use the yeah. search function on that website to look it up. Right. We're looking at something about Amazon dolphins and my daughter's like, we have to do this. And I go, let's use ChatGPT. And I plugged it in <laughs> ChatGPT. We got the list and then we searched those websites through Google using the search function on Google saying only search this website with Google. We cross-referenced, everything was okay. And we wrote down the answers. <laughs> but that's like, you, you got to teach the kids how to use AI, right? Like uh, yeah. if you so, can't use... Even even with like at Trainer Road, engineers who who don't understand how to use AI because it can make two three times your output, and everyone listening is like, if you're not able to use this stuff with your work or you're trying to like go slow, you're going to be left out of the job market because yeah. you're literally could be three times like someone's output could be three times higher than yours. Why would they hire you? Mm -hmm. And even if you were the most amazing person, you could do it as fast as anyone humanly could. The person with AI is going to beat you as the helper who's still right now it's a helper when agi comes artificial general intelligence where it's as smart as a human or can do a task that's better than a human it's going to accelerate you know the progress will be two hundred thousand years in yeah. in, a, in a year because it's just going to be the amount of compute that can come up uh they because it'll be able to self-improve and stuff like that and then we're gonna have singularity where it's going to be smarter than all <laughs> humans put together oh my god i'm bringing us back on track and then hopefully <laughs> we have universal <laughs> basic income and we all just have just food sort of delivered to here. us <laughs> in yeah, so, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so kyle i've got and this is probably gonna be the last uh last question we have uh, yeah, nine yeah. minutes left on the time here I want to talk about limits. So like a person has exceeded, mm -hmm. they've taken in too many carbohydrates that they can't process. Maybe it's this yeah. exact case that we're talking about here with this athlete, but any of us. So what is happening that causes the gut distress? Right. Um, we know the fact that we need to yeah. gradually build it up, but like what is yeah. happening actually mechanically that's causing that? And yeah. then if we have time for this, is there a limit? And, and like, in and, and sh it should we basically be looking, cause if you look at it in terms know. of, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you look at it in terms of, I just want to put this in context and I'm referencing this all the time on the podcast lately, but yeah. people, this is really important to remember. Yeah. If you're riding at 89 Watts for one hour, that means that you have burned 320 kilojoules. That's a, effectively equivalent to what you would take in if you are just taking in 80 grams an hour in carbs. Okay. So yeah. like, that's why I'm getting at, to, cause Energy debt is a massive reason that yeah. that performances are hampered yeah. when you're looking at athletes yeah. like, you know, whether it's Ilya Kipchoge or whether you're looking at yeah. somebody like Filippo Ghana that has an over 500 watt FTP. The poor yeah. man, like, yeah. like it's kind of a curse to have such a high FTP because he'll never be able to fuel. I to have that curse, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, everyone else would listen to this too. Uh, so I guess what's happening that causes the excess problem, and then yeah. we we know that we can train it. So is there a limit to it? Yeah. So I'm more comfortable talking about the latter one than the first one. The first one I just don't know. Like I don't okay. know exactly. I could pause it 
and you think that like, and here's where osmolality could be an issue. The pH of the gut, the pH, the, like there's a bunch of different things where my mind goes. I've definitely worked more on the applied side when it comes to gut and getting food in while exercising than I have the mechanistic scientific side. So that part of it, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable answering. The second part of it, yes, there's a limit. But that limit is a completely floating target and it's going to be completely different. Now, there, there's going to be some exceptional individuals because that's just how like talent and biology works. That's why like we, we have the diversity that we have, like not in a we're all special kumbaya kind of way, but they're literally like we're complex biological systems that are really unique from each other and and that's really beneficial for us as a species when, when you zoom way out on it if i said this is the upper human limit it would be like referencing bolts 9.58 in the 100 meter dash and saying this is no one's run fast even with super spikes whatever like no one's run faster than 9.58, but there's only one person to ever done it. So there probably is like some super upper limit that it, and I don't even want to posit what that is or put that out there. The highest I have experienced in, in just working with elite athletes um, is your guy or our guy, Keegan. He can eat more carbohydrates. And I think he's talked openly about this. I don't think this is anything oh, yes. this... this uh, yeah. Yeah. It's it's not his secret. And, and I, I think he can continue to talk openly about it because I don't know if even if people tried or trained themselves, if they would be able to handle it. He's just like, it's literally a talent. And I think he's, I don't know, what's the last number he told you guys? I think, well, this one, I, I kind of do actually want to be careful about saying one thing here, but we he had like a plan and I think the plan was like at least 120 grams an hour. But then when we did like a post, like we did like a postmortem on it, turns out that it was like significantly higher than that on our podcast. Mateo Jorgensen has mentioned taking in 160 grams an hour. Um, <clears throat> I've seen that also from other very high end athletes. Uh, like when we're talking high end athletes, really high end triathletes have been experimenting with yeah. that, that I've seen. Yeah. Um, I've done and 140 this is like 160 yeah. to 180. I've yeah. seen so people try so, so the if you go back and and look at the papers on this from like a you know a decade or two ago, people are talking about how forty to sixty is like the industry standard, which was mind blowing. And with like special genetics and lots of training, some people might be able to get to a hundred. And when when they started working on that that breaking two project and they basically started applying so this guy named michael joiner who's a really really smart phd guy at the mayo clinic he wrote basically a theoretical paper way before the breaking two project he he wrote this theoretical paper basically saying this is the blueprint for how a person could break the two hour marathon and one of the principal components of that was consuming like this massive, this sort of unheard of amount of, of glucose to, to make up for the, for just the, the lack of ability to store glycogen sufficient to, to complete this thing. Right. And, it, and so now you're starting to hear these things that are just like 140, 160, more than 120. The plan was 120, but we blew it by it. Someone else has talked about, you know, that's sort of the highest that I've heard is that 140 to 160 range. Um, mm -hmm. And at some point, if, if you're, so, so we got to this point at, at, we got to this point with hydration at one point where there, there were like these reports coming out that people were running marathons and gaining weight because of how much they were how much electrolytes and how much water they were drinking during the marathon because they were so convinced that just more was better under all circumstances and so there there has to be uh there's there's typically when it comes to performance there's an upside down you where there's like sort of a range at the top 
and then it starts to actually diminish performance as the X keeps going out. Yeah. And so, yeah, whether it's throwing up, whether it's diarrhea, or it could just be like pain, it could just be physiologic. Like if you, so let's say all gastrointestinal issues aside, you could argue that like, why would I want to get to a point where I'm literally overeating? Like I'm eating beyond the ability of my muscles to process this much energy. So like under those circumstances, it would be like you'd have high blood sugar and you'd have muscle cells turning away blood sugar because they're saying we're at our max, even though we have, you know, so there's like a bunch of really interesting and dynamic like issues around that question because it, it you know, we're thinking about it. I, I think it's a little myopic to only think about it in terms of what we can get through the gut into the system because the system will just burn everything that's in there. At some point, like, like these are just biological pathways that, that have limits. So it's based on the amount of oxygen you can get to the mitochondria, the amount of enzyme, you know, glycolytic enzymes you have, the amount of electron transport chain and not a mitochondria and the size of your mitochondria, the number of capillaries that you have, the amount of nitrate you have that's forming nitric oxide that's increasing vasodilation to locally active muscles. Like there's so many like, like, yeah, the, it, it just gets the brain moving pretty quickly. So, but you know, around 140, 160 is the, the highest I've heard at this point. I, and I don't think that that's right for everybody. And I don't think you have to strive to become the best version of yourself on the bike. I don't think you have to, I, I think it's really important. It's sort of like the conversation we had around weight where it's a little bit dangerous to say what your number is and then, mm and then stake your success on this like thing that you may not have the biological capability of achieving. What I think is you have to say like, okay, I can understand why under certain circumstances I could, this would benefit me. And as I continue to train and as those really long-term adaptations that occur in, in muscle efficiency and mitochondrial density and mitochondrial size and oxygenation and blood characteristics and capillarization and, as those things change, maybe I can take on more. And so maybe this is like a thing I'm thinking about over years, not in a small period of time. Like I'm starting at 20, but in 20 weeks for this like key effort of this year, I want to be at 120. That might not be realistic for all the reasons we've talked about. But you that doesn't mean that four years down the line, you could be at 120. But you're probably also performing at a much higher level because you have all this long-term adaptations because of the continued consistency of your training and things like that. So, yeah, in terms of – there probably is a physiologic peak. Um, I don't know who the Usain Bolt is of of carbohydrate. Like I said, the the person I've worked with the most is is Keegan, and and we've, like, talked openly about that. Um and but i think it's very cool because it's opening up it it's identifying these people that that are talented in this way that also are combining talent with cycling and when you're a match for those things it's allowed the the emergence of this new like prototype of a person that can just go so hard for so long because they're kind of sustaining themselves um in, in a in just a way that people haven't experimented with. The last thing I'll say uh, was something you touched on at the end of your question, which is there are physiologic limits to what we can do and in terms of taking in sugar, but also in terms of producing power for certain amounts of time and things like that. And there will be like strategies and technology and unicorns and things like that, that, that alter our perception of what the human body is capable of and stuff like that. But we can't just like, I can't just want it enough and go like run 50 miles an hour for 45 minutes with a pronghorn antelope just because like I want it eat, no matter how much I trained and things like that. So, so, so it's really important to understand like where your body falls in this and you, yeah, you do want to push it, but if you don't respond to a hundred grams of carbohydrates and you just keep pounding your head against that wall, it's going to start to negatively affect all these other things in your training and in your life, uh, some of them also mental in just regards to like, what's wrong with me? I'm doing the thing they said to do on trainer road and it's not happening. And it's like, no, like 
just pivot. You, you have to be adaptable. You have to pivot uh, under those circumstances. Find a different way to get the most out of what you're working with at this moment and then come and revisit that again way down the road. Right. And that's how that level of consistency, but you can't be consistent if you pound into things so much that you end up overtrained, you end up sick, you end up taking these. The breaks are what like really prevent people from reaching their potential. The consistency is the thing we talk about it all the time, B's and C's, B's and C's. And then there's a three month period where workouts need to be A's and B's, but it's always about consistency. So there's like this product called Red Light Green Light, which will help with that, <laughs> which you can find out at trinaroad.com to make sure you're consistent and don't blow yourself up. Well, so, me. so Fantastic. I want to be, I want to be very clear here. I, the, you're not paying me to, to do this. You're not paying me to say this. You're not paying me to, <laughs> it's true. but, but I told Jonathan, cause, cause I think you teased the red light, green light thing right after. And I told Jonathan, look, like this is being able to, to give actionable type feedback like that. Um, there is a nutrition analog for it that works really, really well for people, uh, of all ages in all different types of, uh, conditions. And, and it's literally called the traffic light diet. And there are green foods that you can eat whenever you want, as much as you want, basically, uh, vegetables, uh, that are, uh, low calorie vegetables. There are yellow foods that you eat, uh, we need. So these are your macronutrients. So we need a certain amount of it, but too much of them in certain forms can be unhealthy. And then there's red foods like high fructose corn syrup and drinking a lot of calories and those sorts of things. In front of the label packaging experiments, uh, where they just label foods in stores and cafeterias and things like that have been very successful in influencing people's to make healthier food choices and drive people in a better direction in mass um, with, so if you can get that recommendation, simple things can work. And so I'll yeah. just, I'll just kind of put that in. Um, Thanks, can I Kyle. say one more thing too? Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, so uh, Nate, don't put spinach in your recovery drink. Uh, that Not recovery drink because of the fiber. It, it, because of the fiber. Yeah. That's right. But I just so daily though. I wake oh, up. Okay. I want some extra Got protein. Yep. Yeah, with my meal. That's different. Yep, that's different. Cool. Yep. And you don't want to put that spinach in the recovery drink because you don't want to slow the digestion. Those Absorption, good yeah. nutrients exactly. getting into you very quickly. Exactly. Sort of that that recovery drink. Food, right? The recovery drink is special for hard training athletes. It's not. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. It's not for just recreationally active. That's you know, eating healthy and eats lunch within an hour of finishing their workout. And they did, you know, a half an hour, 45 minutes on the elliptical machine. That's your, you're not pounding recovery drinks, but for really hard training athletes, a recovery drink is super important. And the absorptability of that is really critical. And the faster we can get that, particularly sugar into the system, the faster your blood sugar can rise and the bigger insulin response you can get, which again is anathema to like public health recommendations. But when you get a nice insulin response, you insulin is a very powerful anabolic hormone. So just yeah. that's a good recap. Awesome. What an awesome podcast. Thanks a bunch, Kyle. Appreciate it. Uh, if anybody wants to follow Kyle or anything else, we'll link down below. He, he isn't very active on Instagram because he's busy doing scientist things. So, um, but you can follow him on there. Anyway, follow Trainer yeah, Road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put down in the comments, if you're watching this, well, I should have said this in the beginning, but put down in the comments down below how many carbs you take in. Maybe I'll see if I can put a poll down there. And it'd be fun to just like source and see how many carbs be. per hour people take in right now and then maybe we'll do a proxy with this and you know later on we'll we'll test it again but it'd be very interesting thanks everybody. hey real quick uh oh, yeah, shout out ahead. shout out to our guy uh josh kerr who uh he in the last episode we talked about him breaking the world record world indoor two mile record and then a couple of weeks later he went to his hometown and or near his hometown his home country in scotland and won the world indoor uh world indoor 3000 meter championship so nice. champ sure. champ now so it's pretty good uh so big shout out to those guys and uh and it's exciting to see the cyclists getting ready to go as well like people are races are getting close so it's cool it's gonna be a good season for kyle's athletes that's for sure <laughs> all right everybody we'll all talk right, to you later you thanks all right so all good bye. thanks